Hello everybody, my name is Bandit and welcome to a new series. In this one, I'm going to be showing you how to create Palladium add-ons. If you don't know, Palladium is a Minecraft Java mod for Minecraft 1.20.1 and it allows you to add your own custom superpowers and abilities into Minecraft. This is what I'm using to create my MHA add-on that you may or may not have seen with other videos on my channel. In this video series, I'm going to be showing you a lot of different guides and steps to creating different powers and abilities and just setting you up with Palladium development so you can create things in the future. This first video, I'm going to show you how to set everything up for your development so you're ready to go there. And in the subsequent videos, I will be talking about specific aspects of Palladium coding. Instead of doing a bunch of long videos, I thought it would be best if I did a bunch of smaller videos that had focus topics. That way, if you ever get confused or lost, people can easily find a specific video related to what they're doing and easily get the information that way. But because I'm breaking it up like that, there's going to be a little bit of a delay between video releases. That just means that not everything is going to be all out at the same time. So if you're watching and following along as I'm making these videos, just know it's going to be a bit before everything is released. I think that's all of the intro out of the way. So let's focus on what we need to do to set up our development environment to do Palladium modding. The first obvious thing that you're going to need is an instance of Minecraft that supports Palladium. The best way I can recommend to get this is to download the ModRynth app. Link for this will be down in the description and you can download it for yourself, but ModRynth allows you to create different instances of Minecraft, modded or vanilla, and easily allows you to maintain and switch between them. I prefer ModRynth over CurseForge just because I find it a little easier to use, and also it has features like the logs right here, which is a really nice and easy way to get information about your Palladium add-on. When you have a fresh instance, of Modrinth, you'll want to come down to the plus and click create new instance. And here, just give it a name. Make sure you select Forge. This tutorial series is going to focus on Forge, although Palladium add-ons are cross-platform between Fabric and Forge, um, but I'm just going to be focusing on Forge here. Make sure you select a game version of 1.20.1 because that's the version of Palladium that we're going to be using. And you can keep this loader version to stable. Once it is done installing, you can go down to this install content button, and this allows you to search for all of the mods that you're going to need for development. So here is my development environment I'm going to be using, and I'm just going to go through the mods here and you can search for them and download them. The two main ones that you're going to need are Palladium, because of course we cannot make a Palladium add-on without it, and CubeJS, which allows us to do a lot more complex features than the regular Palladium will allow. Other useful mods I have are Cubes Without Borders. This just allows you to have Minecraft open in the background and pull other windows up in front of it. So that's very useful when you're switching between your code files. Just Enough Items obviously allows you to view crafting recipes and verify that everything is working from that end. I also have the mm -mm 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 mod, which just adds in a dummy that tells you how much attack damage you're doing. It's great for if you want to see exactly what your powers are doing damage wise. None of those are required, but they're just nice to have. I also recommend installing Gecko Lib because if you want custom animations, Gecko Lib is one of the best ways to do that. And then we have two that are specifically for development only. So these aren't going to be dependencies of anything, but that is CubeJS Offline and Probe.js. In a later video, we'll talk about exactly what they're used for, but just having them prepped and ready for that is good to do. And the rest of these, Rhino, Moonlit, Lib, and Architectury, those are just library add-ons that should have automatically got downloaded. If they didn't, just go ahead and download them now. Those are all of the mods that we'll be needing. Next, we need to install VS Code. Again, the link to VS Code will be down in the description, so just go through and download that following all of the correct instructions. Before we actually create the add-on files, we need to do a couple of things. So I'm actually going to open up the extensions marketplace. So to do that, you push Control shift x and that should open it in your sidebar. An extension in VS Code is just something that someone has created that adds in new functionality. There's a couple of them that we're going to use throughout this series that are going to make things a lot easier. So up in the search bar here, we're going to type in the names of the extensions. So I'm going to have you do that as I show you all of the extensions that we're going to install. The first extension that we're going to install is one that I just created, and it's called Palladium Sense. So make sure it has that with my name here. What this will be used for will again be apparent later in the video, but just click install for now. The next extension is called UUID Generator by NetCorext. There are a couple of other ones available, but I just use this one. Next, we have JSON by Zane Shen. 
I also use a JSON-Color-Token by uh, this name here. This one is helpful when you're defining color codes for things, and it will show you inside of the editor what it actually looks like. And then the final one is Data Pack Helper Plus by Spyglass, and its author is SP Godding here. This one has a few useful features for editing data packs, which is something that we will be doing as well. All right, all of your extensions should be installed and you may need to close your VS Code and reopen it just for them to all register. But now what we need to do is go up to File and click Open Folder. What we need to do is point VS Code to our ModRynth instance where we downloaded all of those mods. So the easiest way to do that is open ModRynth and inside of your development environment, click on these three dots here Click Open Folder. This will open the Minecraft instance here in the File Explorer. So come up to the top here and click in the white space and copy that over to this one here, pressing Enter. And you can see we now have all of the files here, so we can just click Select Folder. If this pops up, you can just click Yes, I Trust the Authors. And with that, we have our Minecraft instance opened inside of VS Code. And what I mean by that is we have access to all of the folders that are in the base Minecraft folder, including our saves for all of our world files, the mods folder where we can see listed all of the jar files, and even the logs folder so we can easily look at logs right inside of VS Code. The most important one, however, is probably the add-on packs folder because this is where the add-on is actually going to go. Before we create the add-on, there's a few more settings in VS Code that I'm gonna have you turn on because I just find them super useful. Come up to File, then go down to Preferences and click on Settings. Right at the top here, there should be something that says Files and Autosave. If you do not see that, just come up to the Search Settings and type in Autosave. But what we're going to do is change this to After Delay. What this will do is have VS Code automatically save your files. This is important because one, you could accidentally close VS Code and lose your progress. But two, the changes you make won't actually be active until the file is actually saved. The next thing I want you to do is come up to search and type in documentation path. You should see Palladium Sense documentation path here, and this is just from my add-on, so you can tell it where the documentation files for Palladium live. To get the correct file path, you need to go into Modrinth and first make sure you have ran Minecraft at least once. Once you've done that, go to the three dots, click open folder, and inside of here, we're gonna go into the mods folder, the documentation folder, and then the Palladium folder. Now just copy the file path completely up here and paste it into this box. All this is doing is telling the extension where the Palladium documentation is. Because we opened the Minecraft instance as a workspace, we don't technically need this, but this only applies in the instance where you open up a standalone file and you need to have access to that documentation. That's the last setting in here, so we can click X to get out of that. And one more setting we need to change is actually inside of Modrinth. So if you come down here to the bottom, there is the settings icon. And from here, go down to the default instant options section. Scroll down a little bit till you find memory allocated. By default, this is set to a low value. So 4,000 is probably what it's set to. If your computer allows for it, I would increase that RAM slightly up to 8,000 or you can do a little more if you want. All this is doing is allocating more RAM to Minecraft. So it just is going to run smoother, especially if you wanna add a bunch of other mods down the line. All right, that should be the last configuration thing. So now we can actually create our first add-on pack. This video is not going to actually create any powers. We're just gonna create all of the base files. And to do that, it's actually very easy because we have installed my Palladium Sense extension. What we're gonna do is Control Shift P on the keyboard to open up the command palette. And we're gonna type in here, initialize, and then new add-on right here. We're gonna click on this and it's going to ask us for the display name. So this is going to be the name of your add-on that everyone will see when they download it. Throughout this series, I'm going to be making one called Professional Heroes. Once you have the name, just hit enter. And now we need the mod ID. The mod ID is what distinguishes your powers from everything else. And so it has to be a unique identifier. It also has to be all lowercase. Usually you want it to sort of match what the name of the mod is. So for mine, since it's Professional Heroes, I'm just going to do the mod ID of Prof. Next, we need to give it a description. So this will be mine. And then of course the author. So you can put your Minecraft name or you can do your developer name, whatever you want. It really doesn't matter and hit enter. And what you'll see is it closes the window and over here, the add-on packs should now be glowing green. If we go inside of the add-on packs folder, we'll see we now have a professional heroes folder. And inside of that, we have a couple of files. 
What my extension has done is auto create a bunch of the folder structure and some of the base files that you would need in order to create an add-on. This includes the add-on folder, the assets folder, the data folder, and the meta inf folder. We'll be going into what each of these folders do, but for now we're going to focus on the meta inf folder, specifically inside of it, the mods.tomo file. This file, along with the fabricmod.json and the pack.mc meta file, are the three files you need in order to define an add-on in the first place. The mods.tomo file is for Forge to understand the information it needs about your mod. So for example, we've defined the mod ID here. Here is the version of the mod, so we can change this to be whatever version you're currently working on. Here's that display name that we made, and here's the description of the mod itself. And down here is where we set up the dependencies that this add-on is going to have. Right now we only have one, and that is the Palladium mod itself. So you give it the mod ID of the mod you're trying to depend on. So in this case, Palladium. We're saying that it is mandatory because we do need this to run. And next we define the version range, which tells it which version of Palladium is considered valid. Right now it's generated to 4.4.2 because that is the current up-to-date version of Palladium. And we can see that by looking at the Palladium version here in Modrinth. It is 4.4.2. This notation here of using the square bracket on the left side is telling us that 4.4.2 is the lowest that we can be when it comes to this version. On the right side of the comma, it has nothing except an open parenthesis, and that is saying anything above 4.4.2 is also accepted. In the future, if Palladium comes out with an update that has specific features that you need, then you'll come here and edit this appropriately, but by default, this is all you need. The next file we should learn about is the fabricmod.json, and this one looks a little different, but this is what Fabric uses to get information about your mod. You can see we've defined the authors, we have the mod ID right here, and again, similarly, a version, a display name, and a description as well. And finally, we have the pack.mc meta file. This one is specific for the data pack element of the Palladium add-ons, um, so it just has a little bit of information like the mod ID, the description, and the pack format here, which we need to define as 15 for this version of Minecraft. Beyond the dependency version inside of the mods.tomo, you really wouldn't need to change these files unless of course you want to change the version. All right, so that is all of the setup we need to do inside of VS Code. But there's one last thing I will have you install that's going to be useful, and I'm actually going to walk you through this one. The next thing we're going to install is a program called Git. Git is a version control software, meaning it's able to keep track of different versions and variations of your code as you develop it. It also has built-in methods to create documentation as you go to keep track of all of the changes that you've been making. Link to this will be down in the description, and you'll just come and select your operating system, and then you select the installer. For Windows, we're going to click this link right here. Once it's downloaded, you're going to run the executable and go here. We'll keep this as default. For all of these options, make sure these ones are all checked. Hit next. You can keep the default menu. For the editor, we're going to change this to VS Code. Hit next. For this one, you can leave it as default, but I like to come here and change the default branch name to main. Hit next. And let's do this option of get from the command line and also from third-party software. Choose bundled open SSH. Use the native Windows secure channel library. And we'll keep the Windows styles commit. This one here, we'll be using min TTY. Keep it on fast forward or merge. Choose Git Credential Manager. You can enable file system caching and hit install. Mostly just selecting the defaults for everything. And there we go, hit finish. Now you can use Git by itself, but I would actually recommend creating an account on GitHub. You can think of GitHub as an online service that kind of hosts the versions that you've created using Git. Essentially, a copy of the code that you create will be stored up in the cloud, and this not only allows you to present it to other people, but it also allows for easy collaboration and management of the project. You can see here that all of my code for my MHA add-on is here, uh, as well as some nice uh, information about it. After making an account on GitHub, you can use Git by itself that we just downloaded, but I would actually recommend getting one more download, and that is called GitHub Desktop. Link for this will be in the description, but this is just a graphical way of syncing your computer to everything that is on GitHub in the cloud. I find it's the easiest for beginners to use, which is why I'm going to recommend it today. Go ahead and download and run the installer and sign in with your brand new GitHub account. Once downloaded, it looks like this. And once you're signed into GitHub Desktop on here, we can actually go up to File and click 
add local repository. It's going to ask you to choose a path. So we're going to click choose and we're actually going to go into the path of our actual add-on. So once again, click the three dots open folder inside of your Minecraft Modrinth instance. Then we're going to copy the file path just in here. Now we can go inside to add-on packs the add-on pack that you have, and this is the folder that we just need to select. So just click select, click add repository, and right away you should see some files here that are all set up with plus signs. Like I said before, I'm going to be explaining Git in more detail in a separate video. However, the thing you want to do right now is make sure that all of these files are checked, then come down here to this summary required, and we're going to just give a message. This is called a commit message, and it's basically telling you what exactly you're trying to save. And in this case, we're just created a new add on. So we're going to say initial files. Then we're going to click this big blue button that says commit six files to master. When you do this for the first time, you'll see this big blue box over here that asks if you want to publish the repository. So we're actually going to click that button here because we want to upload what we have done to github.com. And again, it's going to be backed up in the cloud instead of just on our computer. So we're going to give it a name. I'm going to say professional heroes example add on, and you can give it a description. There we go. And you can have this box checked if you want to keep all of the code private so only you can see it. Uh, but in my case, I want everyone to be able to see all of the progress. So I'm going to uncheck this, making it a public repository. Once you have those fields filled out, you can click the publish repository button. And there we go. It has just uploaded everything to the github.com website. To view it on GitHub, you can simply go to this view on GitHub button. And there we have it. Here's all of the files we uploaded. You may be wondering why there's only a few files here and not all of them. For example, if we look over in the assets folder, we have a bunch of other folders. Why are those not uploaded? Well, the reason for that is GitHub will only upload actual files. Most of these folders are empty because they're just sitting here waiting for you to put information inside of them. And as a result of that, GitHub will ignore those empty directories. So we only have a few things. All right, so that is all of the setup that we need to do in order to get developing a Palladium add-on. I know it was a lot. There was a lot of downloading involved, but hopefully you were able to follow. If you have any questions, leave a comment down in the comment section below. And also I do have a Discord, so I'll set up a Palladium help channel and you can ask any questions related to the video there. In the next video, I'm going to go in further detail about the file structure that we created. So all of those auto-generated folders, I'm going to explain exactly what each one of them does. And in the video, following that, we're going to actually add a new power. Again, these videos are going to be more focused in topic so that you can always go back and easily revisit things if you have any questions or get confused on certain topics. If you found this video helpful, make sure you press the subscribe button so you don't miss the rest in the series. And I will see you in the next one.